Tennessee's At Home Learning Series for Literacy. Today's lesson is for all our third graders out there, but all children are welcome to tune in. This lesson is the fourth in our series. If you didn't see our previous lesson, you can find it on the Tennessee Department of Education website at www.tn.gov backslash education. My name is Miss Copeland and I'm a third grade teacher at Venus Stewart Elementary in Gallatin, Tennessee. I'm so excited to be your teacher for this lesson. Welcome to my classroom. I am missing the students in my own classroom. Every day I want to share a note with one student. The note today is for Diane. Diane, I sure do miss seeing your beautiful smile every day. I miss seeing you participate in our every day in class. I especially miss all of your kindness and thoughtfulness you show everyone around you. I miss you from Miss Goodwood. Welcome back to our third grade read aloud of The Wind in the Willows. In our last lessons, we thought about how authors convey central messages and how, author, how characters' actions impact the story. I wish I could hear the story you wrote yesterday using the central messages and the events. Imaginative writing is fun, especially with interesting characters like Mole and Rat. Today, you will need your character papers from the first three lessons, paper and a pencil. I want you to think about the four seasons and their characteristics. When I think of the seasons, I think of flowers blooming in the spring, kids swimming in the summer, trees dropping their leaves in the fall, and snowflakes falling in the winter. I want you to think about how the changing seasons affect animals and plants. Which seasons have not yet occurred in the wind and the willows? And which seasons will come next? Fall and winter are coming. Think about what our animal characters might do in the winter. Now I want you to think about the difference between dialogue, narration, and perspective. Try to jot a quick, a quick explanation for each on your paper. So I want you to think about what was dialogue, what was narration, What is the meaning of perspective? Remember, dialogue is when a character is speaking in the story. We can tell that a character is speaking because around the dialogue are quotation marks before and after the character speaks. There's also a dialogue tag somewhere in the sentence that shows which character is speaking. Narration is something that the narrator is telling us about what the character is thinking or doing, but does not include quotation marks, like in this sentence. However, Toad, for it was he, shook his head and concentrated on the task at hand. That is something the narrator is telling us, but no characters are saying any words out loud. Finally, perspective was how someone sees or ex experiences something. Perspective is a literary tool like dialogue and narration, and it lets the reader know from whose experience we are learning more about the story. Perspective, like dialogue, can shift from one character to another. Listen carefully to today's read aloud for a shift in perspective. The title of this chapter is The Wild Wood. What do you see in this picture? Remember the dialogue between rat and mole in lesson one? Let me reread it to you. What lies over there? asked the mole, waving a paw towards a background of woodland that darkly framed the water meadows on one side of the river. Well, the rat replied hesitantly, that's the wild wood. We don't go there too often. 
Are there scary creatures there? Mole asked, trying not to tremble. The squirrels are all right, Rat replied. And the rabbits, some of them. The rabbits are a mixed lot. And then there's Badger, of course. He lives right in the heart of it. Wouldn't live anywhere else either. Dear old Badger, nobody interferes with him. Why, who should interfere with him? asked the mole. Well, of course, there are others, explained the rat in a hesitating sort of way. Weasels, stoats, foxes, and so on. They're all right in a way. I'm very good friends with them, past the time of day when we meet, but you can't trust them, and that's a fact. Now remember, as we, list, as we read today, listen carefully for seasonal characteristics about, and think about where the shift in perspective is taking place. Remember, we've read about, in lesson one, about Mole's house was where our setting took place in lesson one. Today, we will be reading about the wild wood, which is taking place here in our map. The mole had long wanted to meet the badger, but the water rat always had a reason to postpone the occasion. Badger will turn up someday or other, the rat would say. Couldn't you ask him to dinner, said the mole. He wouldn't come, replied the rat simply. Well then, supposing we go and call on him, suggested the mole. Oh, he wouldn't like that at all, said the rat, quite alarmed. Besides, he lives in the middle of the wild wood. Well, supposing he does like it, said the mole. You told me the wild wood was all right. I know, so it is, replied the rat evasively. But he wouldn't be at home at this time of year anyhow. The mole had to be content with this. Summer had left, taking the warmth and sweet fragrances with it. The autumn and winter days brought cold winds and glistening frost. No one thought about boating, and so, with time to ponder, the mole began to think once more of Badger. In the winter time, the rat slept a great deal. He retired early and rose late. Consequently, Mole had plenty of spare time on his hands. One afternoon, while the rat rested in his armchair before the fire, he decided he would explore the wild wood and perhaps meet Mr. Badger. Let's pause our story for a moment. Take a second to think about what you may have learned about mole and rat. Jot your thoughts down on your character papers. Pause the video if you need more time to think. When mole asks rat to go with him to see Mr. Badger, why do you think rat wants to postpone the visit or tells mole evasively that he doesn't think Mr. Badger is at home? Say your answer out loud. I know Mr. Badger lives in the wild wood and Rat seems a little uncomfortable about going there. He'd rather Mr. Badger come to visit him. How does Rat sleeping affect Mole? Say your answer out loud. I think because Rat is sleeping, Mole has more time to do other things, like explore the wild wood. It was a cold, still afternoon when he slipped out of a warm parlor. The country lay bare and leafless around him. The mole liked the country like this, stripped of its finery. And so, with great cheerfulness of spirit, he pushed on toward the wild wood. There was nothing to alarm him at first. Then, as his journey progressed, he moved into a shadowy world in which trees crouched nearer and the holes in various tree trunks gaped like hideous mouths. The dusk descended steadily. Then the faces began. It was over his shoulder that he first thought he saw a face. When he turned and confronted it, the thing had vanished. He quickened his pace. He passed another hole, and a little narrow face flashed up. If he could only get away from the holes, he thought, there would be no more faces. He swung off the path and plunged 
into the untrodden places of the wood. Then the whistling began. Very faint it was when he first heard it, but somehow it made him hurry forward. Then the pattering began. He thought it was only falling leaves at first. Then as it grew, he knew it was the pat, pat, pat of little feet. The mole began to run. He ran up against things. He fell over things. At last, he took refuge in the hollow of an old beech tree. Terrified and exhausted, the mole lay there trembling. Let's pause our story for a moment. Thinking about the author's description of the wild wood, how is Mole's perspective changing about the setting? How is he starting to think differently about the wild wood? Jot a quick list of words and phrases that describe his reaction. I love how the author starts with the phrase cheerfulness of spirit and moves towards words like terrified, exhausted, quickened, plunged, and trembling to show us how Mole's perspective of the wild wood is changing. Something in our story is about to change. Think about what it is as we read. Meanwhile, the rat, warm and comfortable, dozed by his fireside. It was not until a coal in the fire slipped and sent up a spurt of flames that he awoke. He immediately looked around for his companion, but the mole was not there. He listened for a time. The house seemed very quiet. Then he called, Molly, several times, and receiving no answer, got up and went out into the hall. The mole's cap was missing from its peg. His Wellington boots were also gone. The rat left the house and found the mole's tracks leading straight to the wild wood. The rat stood deep in thought. Then he re-entered the house, strapped a belt around his waist, and shoved a brace of pistols into it. Finally, he picked up a stout cudgel and set off for the wild wood. Let's pause and think together. At the beginning of the story, from which character's perspective is the story told? It was Mole's perspective. What is happening in the story when the, sto when the story changes to Rat's perspective? I realize that Mole is lost and Rat goes looking for him when the perspective changes. Now we're hearing from Rat's point of view, Rat's perspective. It was already getting towards dusk when he reached the wood. As he moved among the trees, the rat looked about for his friend. Here and there, wicked little faces popped out of holes, but vanished immediately at the sight of such a well-armed creature. The rat called out to his friend for an hour or more, when at last he heard a little answering cry. Guided by the sound, he made his way to an old beech tree with a hole in it. From out of the hole came a feeble voice saying, Ratty, is that really you? The rat crept into the hole, and there he found the mole. Oh, rat, he cried, I've been so frightened. Oh, I quite understand, said the rat soothingly. We river bankers hardly ever come here by ourselves. Surely the brave Mr. Toad wouldn't mind coming here by himself, would he? inquired the mole. Old Toad, said the rat, laughing heartily. He wouldn't show his face here alone for anything. The mole was greatly cheered by the sound of the rat's laughter. Now then, said the rat, we really must make a start for home. Dear ratty, said the poor mole, you must let me rest a while longer. Oh, all right, said the rat. It's nearly pitch dark now, and there ought to be a bit of moon later. So the mole snuggled down and went to sleep while the rat lay, patiently waiting, with a pistol in his paw. When at last the mole woke up, the rat said, Now then, I'll just take a look outside and see if everything is quiet, 
and then we really must be off. He went to the entrance and put his head out. What's up, Braddy? asked the mole. Snow is up, replied the rat briefly, or rather, down. The mole came and crouched beside him, and, looking out, saw that a gleaming carpet of fine powder was springing up everywhere. Well, it can't be helped, said the rat. We must make a start. The worst of it is, I don't exactly know where we are. And now, this snow makes everything look so very different. Let's pause and think together. What central message does this section support? Remember, we had said central message was the moral or lesson that the character learns and that you can learn from the story. I notice that rat goes searching for mole, which supports the central message that friends are loyal. Loyalty to friends can mean you feel a sense of responsibility to help them when they are in need. It did indeed. Nevertheless, they set out bravely. An hour or two later, they realized that they were lost. They sat down on a fallen tree trunk to rest. We can't sit here very long, said the rat. The snow will soon be too deep for us to wade through. He peered about him and considered. Look here, he went on. There's a dell down in front of us. A dell is a small wooden valley, like in the song, The Farmer and the Dell. Let's make our way down into that and try to find some sort of shelter. So once more, they plodded onward. As they searched for a corner that was dry, the mole tripped and fell forward on his face. Oh, my leg, he cried. Oh, my poor shin. Poor old mole said the rat kindly. You don't seem to be having much luck today. Let's have a look at that leg. I must have tripped over a hidden branch or a stump, said the mole miserably. It's a very clean cut, said the rat, examining it. It looks as if it was made by a sharp edge of something made of metal. Well, never mind what done it, said the mole, forgetting his grammar in his pain. It hurts just the same, whatever done it. But the rat, after carefully tying up the leg with his handkerchief, was busy scraping in the snow. He scratched and shoveled while the mole waited impatiently. Suddenly the rat cried, Hooray! What have you found, Ratty? asked the mole. Come and see, said the delighted rat. The mole hobbled up to the spot and had a good look. Well, he said at last slowly, I see it right enough. A door scraper. Well, what of it? A door scraper is a small metal frame located near the front door on which people can scrape the mud off their shoes before entering a house. But don't you see what it means? cried the rat. Of course I see what it means, replied the mole. It means that some very careless person has left his door scraper lying about in the middle of the wild wood. Oh dear, cried the rat in despair. Here, stop arguing and come and dig. And he set to work again and made the snow fly in all directions. After some further effort, a very shabby doormat lay exposed to view. There, what did I tell you? exclaimed the rat. Absolutely nothing, replied the mole with perfect truthfulness. You seem to have found another piece of domestic litter. Do you mean to say, cried the rat, that this doormat doesn't tell you anything? Really, rat, said the mole, who ever heard of a doormat telling anyone anything? They simply don't do it. Doormats know their place. Now look here, you, you thick-headed beast, replied the rat really angrily. Keep digging if you want to sleep dry and warm tonight. The rat, using his cudgel, attacked a snowbank with great ferocity. The mole scraped busily, too. Some ten minutes later, the rat's cudgel struck something that sounded hollow. He called the mole to come and help him. Before long, their efforts were rewarded. 
For there in the side of a snowbank stood a little door, an iron bell pull hung by the side. Below the bell on a small brass plate were the moonlit words, Mr. Badger. The mole fell backwards on the snow. Rat, he cried, you are a wonder. You knew that, there was, that if there was a door scraper, there was bound to be a doormat. If I only had your head, ratty. But as you haven't, interrupted the rat, I suppose you're going to sit on the snow all night and talk. Get up at once and hang on to that bullpell while I hammer. Do you think Mr. Badger is at home? We'll find out in the next read aloud. Which season is this chapter set in and how do you know? It is winter because it is cold and snowy and Mole is wearing winter clothes. We've been talking about this central message about how friends are loyal and how characters' actions and words demonstrate loyalty to their friends in different ways. Today, we talked specifically about how friends might feel a sense of responsibility toward helping their friends when they are in trouble. We had also written in our last lesson about some specific things that the characters did to show the central message of friends are loyal. For example, we said Rat takes Mole to call on Toad to go visit Toad. Rat agrees to travel with Toad so that Toad won't be alone. And that Rat doesn't want to disappoint Mole. What are some additional examples of how Mole and Rat demonstrated loyalty to one another in the section that we have read today? Some examples I thought of were Rat let the mole rest when he was feeling bad, Rat bandaged mole's leg when he got hurt, and that the mole helped Rat dig to find the doormat. We also read today about an example of an irresponsible choice that mole made. What would be examples of some of these irresponsible actions? An example that popped into my mind is when Mole takes off for the wild wood all by himself and without knowing his way. Today, Mole's perspective of the wild wood changed from excited, cheerful, to feeling very differently. I want you to pretend that you are Mole today. And I want you to create a poster warning the other animals about the wild wood. Think about the words the author used to help you understand the change in perspective and how the author's choices might affect the words and pictures you choose for your poster. Remember to have fun and be creative with your posters. I wish I could see what you create. Boys and girls, I enjoyed reading with you today. Thank you for inviting me into your home. I look forward to seeing you in our next lesson in Tennessee's At Home Learning Series. Goodbye, and I will see you tomorrow. Hello, I'm Maria Lee, First Lady of Tennessee, and I'm so glad you're here. This has been an unprecedented time for our state and our country. I'm so proud to see how Tennesseans are coming together to serve and lift each other up in the midst of challenges. Each of us has a role to play, including you, our students. Right now, your school buildings may be closed, but there are many opportunities to keep learning. And we are so grateful for the partnership of PBS in bringing this program directly to you as one more way to keep us learning and growing together during this time. I want to also give a special thank you to all of the teachers who helped make this possible. We could not do it without them. Most of all, thank you for joining us. What's up all you crazy Tennesseans? It's me, Coach Wood again. Get off the couch, let's get moving. I got my toilet paper. Go find you some toilet paper. Let's get started. Put it in front of you, start marching. We're at the grocery store. Let's start pushing that shopping cart.
pushing that shopping cart. We're going to the store. Mom, can we go to the cereal aisle, please? Bring us to the cereal aisle. Oh, we'll go in a minute. Hold on, we gotta go get some toilet paper. All right, oh, stop. Oh, there we go. Easy, super easy. Let's grab another one. Nice. Oh, uh-oh, turn it around. Boom, here we go. Grab the toilet paper. Here we go. Turn it around. Oh, Coach, what are you crazy, man? No, oh, I'm not crazy. You're the one doing it with me. <laughs> here we go. Toilet paper. All day, get it. You're thinking, Coach, this is pretty easy. All right, let's make it a little harder. Squat down. Get the toilet paper. Oh, oh. Okay. Squat down. Get the toilet paper. Yeah. Reverse, reverse. Oh, where are you going? I'm just getting toilet paper. Don't worry about me. Worry about yourself. Woo. Be sure not to hit anyone in the legs with the toilet paper. One more down low. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? We're going high now. Going high. Coming around and jump. Woo! Got it. Coming around. Coming around. Jump. We're working our whole body here. Our tippy toes to our fingertips. Here we go. Turn around. Woo! Here we go. Woo! Two more. Two more. You got it. Come on, all you kids. Get up. Get moving. Here we go. Here we go. And whoo, man, shake it out. You guys did awesome. Uh, 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 awesome, awesome, awesome. I'll stop. All right, don't worry about it. Hey, if you want more PE videos, go to my YouTube page, youtube.com slash C slash Coach Wood. I got a bunch of videos up. Check them out. They're fun. There might be toilet paper involved. Peace. Peace.